It's fairly widely accepted across terrestrial predators that within those populations, there are problem individuals. I can guarantee you'll have seen videos before of Indian leopards strolling into local villages, causing absolute carnage and on occasion killing humans in the process. And the same has happened before with tigers, lions, coyotes, wolves, snakes, crocodiles, polar bears, that list could go on and on. When certain individuals within a population have come into contact with humans and bitten or even killed a human, they'll often be referred to as a nuisance or a problem in Individual. Some research that came out towards the end of last year though showed that this problem individual concept can also be applied to sharks. And they've got evidence to back it up. Individual sharks around the world have repeatedly been seen showing aggression towards humans and those individuals have on occasion gone on to bite or even kill people. So come with me today as we have a look at this idea of problem sharks. We'll look at the research that's been done including a few pretty grim case studies and we'll find out if there really are certain individuals within shark populations that have got a taste for humans. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode everyone. Now, now at first glance, this whole problem shark concept might just seem like a reimagining of the rogue shark theory. That particular theory coined by Australian surgeon Victor Coppelson in the 1950s, although accepted at the time, is now widely criticized and rejected by shark scientists across the world. It was used to try and explain clusters of fatal shark attacks in certain areas. You might have heard of one of those clusters before, the one that ended up inspiring the book Jaws. Yeah the Jersey Shore attacks. Anyway, the theory was that if a certain shark had killed and eaten a human, it would develop a taste for human flesh and go on to kill and consume more and more people. This was behaviorally different to other individuals within that population, so that shark was deemed to be a rogue. The theory was later popularized by the Jaws film in the mid 1970s, which prompted its rejection by scientists in the following decade, citing its anthropomorphic tendencies. It basically projected a human idea in that rogueness onto sharks, and nature just doesn't work like that. So how is the rogue shark theory different to the idea of problem sharks because the two do kind of sound a bit similar, especially when you look into the definition for a problem shark, which says that a shark can be defined as problematic when it one, demonstrates atypical behavior compared to the rest of the population, two, engages in repeated agonistic behavior directed towards humans, and three, has bitten or attempted to bite humans in probable feeding attempts. On the face of it, it looks pretty similar to the rogue shark theory, but there are a few key differences here. The first of which is that problem shark or problem individual does and anthropomorphize the motivations of sharks. The word rogue implies there's some kind of savagery or destructive tendencies for that thing in question, or perhaps that the animal has something inherently wrong with it. In the case of the rogue shark, the thing that's wrong with it is that that individual has now gotten a taste for human flesh and it's gonna to continue to eat more and more humans, which is a pretty simplistic viewpoint. Problem shark, on the other hand, highlights that there isn't anything wrong with that animal. They can be completely healthy, normal individuals that just happen to be exploring their environment and the potential prey items within it. It's just a problem for us as humans. The rogue shark theory as well puts all of its emphasis on the shark itself and doesn't take into account the other environmental factors in play that we regularly speak about here on shark bites like topography or water visibility, etc. Environmental factors as well as the individual personality of a shark are not mutually exclusive things. They'll often work in tandem. Now this idea of problem individuals is actually a fairly controversial one because it tends to buck the trend for how sharks have been presented to us down the years in an attempt to reverse the damage of their demonization. You guys know my thought process on this, and I've spoken regularly on the channel about how I think we as shark scientists need to present them truthfully to members of the public, as in, they're not monsters that need to be demonized and killed, but on the other hand, they're not harmless either. So because the idea is actually fairly controversial, it's got to have some decent evidence to back it up. But how can you prove that one individual shark is responsible for multiple attacks on humans? Well, at the moment, we've got two methods, genetics and photo identification. When a shark bites a human, that particular individual deposits mucus along the bite margins, and that mucus contains DNA specific to that individual shark. So if you're able to swab the wounds of a human victim, you can recover that DNA, and that can help you genetically profile the shark or sharks responsible. It's what scientists did for some of the attacks on Reunion Island, showing that at least half of the incidents there were from bull sharks. It's what a forensics department would do in the case of a human crime, like a murder case. And it's also exactly what was done in the case of one fatal and one non-fatal shark attack in the Caribbean back in 2020. In December 2020, a female swimmer was fatally wounded after an estimated three meter long shark bit down and consumed her entire left thigh while she was swimming on the French Caribbean island of St. Martin. One month later in January 2021, Brooke Toussaint was bitten again by a three meter long shark in St. Kitts and Nevis, about 50 miles away from the first attack. Brooke, who was snorkeling at the time, was bitten on the leg, of which had to be amputated to save a life. On both occasions, scientists collected wound swabs from the victims, and although the DNA was degraded, they were able to compare the samples to a reference database of 49 
nine tiger sharks in this part of the Caribbean. Eventually, it was concluded there was an extremely low scientific probability that those two incidents were from two different sharks. Basically, it was the same tiger shark both times. Now, while this is quite an impressive method, looking at it critically, it does have its drawbacks. The first is that genetic samples like this degrade very easily and pretty quickly after you take the sample, which means that when you try and amplify it during analysis, certain pieces of the puzzle are missing. And the second is that in order to identify it down to an individual level, you have to have a genetic database for which to compare it to. So in areas where your population of sharks is quite big, you might not have enough reference data or enough individual sharks that have been genetically analyzed to be able to give you that comparison. But genetic analysis isn't the only method here. We've also got the other one that I mentioned, photo identification. This second method is a fairly reliable and low cost method for being able to distinguish between individual sharks within a population based on certain body or fin patterns. There are some shark species it works better on than others, but for the big four, whites, tigers, bulls, and oceanic white tips, it does work. All four of those sharks can on occasion have body markings or fin patterns and notches that can allow you to distinguish between individuals. It's not easy, but it's possible. And then you pair that with how common it is now for people to go snorkeling or scuba diving with underwater cameras or GoPros, then the likelihood of you getting pictures of a problem shark is even higher. Which brings us quite nicely onto our next two case studies, one of which lots of you will have heard about or seen before. The first one though involved a series of bites on humans over the space of two years in Costa Rica from a known tiger shark called Lagatha. Lagatha, who was just over three meters long, started showing signs of atypical curiosity and even aggression as early as 2014. She was fairly recognizable because of her behavior, regularly coming in close to divers, whereas the other tiger sharks within that population would never come close, always staying several meters away. But she was also recognizable from some of her physical features. Lagatha had a permanent white spot on her dorsal fin, which you can see here, and it's clearly visible when viewing her right flank or when she's swimming from left to right. She also had distinct notches in her dorsal fin, which when you look at photos, allows you to directly compare that dorsal fin with others. Basically, it's pretty easy to identify Lagatha from other tiger sharks, even for someone who might not necessarily have had shark identification training. Over the space of several years, Lagatha was regularly seen coming in close to scuba divers and displaying particularly aggressive tendencies to those divers. In several of these clips here, you can see her rolling over a nictitating membrane, displaying her flank, opening and closing her jaw. We've even got this subtle pectoral fin depression here as well, which is a little bit harder to see in tiger sharks because their pec fins are quite squat and chubby. Sorry, tiger sharks. Anyway, Lagatha would regularly approach divers on their ascent to the surface, several meters off the bottom, right in the middle of the water column, forcing divers to kick at her with their fins. And as a result of these aggressive displays, dive masters in the Cocos Islands resorted to diving with sticks to try and deter her, which again, you can see in some of these clips. Although in 2017, these aggressive behaviors turned into something else. 49 year old Rahina Bandari and her accompanying dive master were approached by Lagatha on their safety stop five meters from the surface. The dive master tried to push the shark away, but was bitten on the foot in the process and the boat captain after seeing the commotion at the surface managed to pull the injured dive master onto the boat at this point identifying Lagatha by her dorsal fin notches and that white spot. As the dive master was being hauled onto the boat Lagatha turned her attention to Rahina and began biting her legs. To try and save her the boat captain rammed the shark with his boat and although he managed to retrieve Rahina from the water she died within a minute of being back on the boat from blood loss. Six months after this an underwater photographer from Germany became separated from his dive group while he was on a dive not too far from the location of the first incident when he was attacked from behind by a large shark. The German scuba diver ditched the tank which remained in the shark's mouth and swam to the surface where he refuged on a rock and waited for the dive boat to come and pick him up. And it was here he was able to identify Lagatha by her white spot and dorsal fin notches as she swam around the rock at the surface. Nearly a year later in 2019, Lagatha hadn't been seen in several months when she suddenly reappeared and approached a scuba diver who again had become separated from his dive group as he was ascending to the surface. The diver had to repel her three times by hitting her on the snout with his underwater camera before eventually being hauled back onto the boat. As it was happening, he was able to take pictures of the shark in question, which as you can see here, is undoubtedly Lagatha. Now, I don't think there's any denying here that Lagatha was somewhat of a problem shark, displaying behaviors that were vastly different to any of the other tiger sharks within that population. In this example, it may have been because she was a particularly bold or aggressive shark in terms of her personality, but looking at some of these photos here, she doesn't look to be in the healthiest of conditions. In this one here, you can see a dorsal fin is a mess and the muscles just below the dorsal 
dorsal fin are pretty emaciated. She's got scars all over her body and a hook embedded in her mouth as well. So this poor body condition could be an indicator of her aggression and might have been one of the major drivers for those bites on the divers. On some occasions though, there are sharks who appear to be completely healthy individuals who will still go on to bite and kill humans. And that brings us on to our third case study of which many of you will have seen or heard about before and that's the oceanic white tips in the Red Sea. This particular series of incidents are from 2009, so that's a year before the spate of attacks in 2010, of which were attributed to an emaciated white tip. Anyway, it all starts with this particular clip here that I have shown you before here on Shark Bites. Hit that like button if you remember this one. This particular female oceanic white tip shark is showing all the signs of an aggressive individual. You've got clear pectoral fin depression there and repeated attempts to get closer to the scuba divers. The video itself was taken at St. John's Reef in the Red Sea on the 24th of May 2009, but a week later on the 1st of June 2009, a French tourist was bitten multiple times on the leg by this shark here, a large female oceanic white tip shark on the very same reef and died of her wounds. The following day, less than a mile away, a 36 year old dive master was bitten on the shoulder by a female oceanic white tip. And the day after that, two miles away, another dive master repelled again a female oceanic white tip shark who was trying to bite his fins and calf. On all three of those occasions, photos were taken of the particular shark in question, highlighting some of the key identifying features that show it was the same individual. Here you can see photos A, B, and C are from those three incidents across the first three days of June 2009. All of them show a large female oceanic white tip shark, and we can see here with the dorsal fin marking zoomed in that they appear to be the same, especially with that little rectangular patch on the top left corner there. On the left pectoral fin as well, we can see a bit of a skin growth, possibly from a healed injury. Now, from the video taken a week before, we can't really see any of those identifying features, but we can see that it's a large female oceanic white tip who happens to be showing aggressive behavior on the very same reef where a week later, there's a series of incidents. Now we can't say it with 100% certainty, but it's likely to be the same shark. On this occasion here, there's no evidence that this shark looks malnourished or unhealthy in any way, which tends to point to another reason for its aggression. And that is personality traits that indicate a significantly more bold individual when compared to others, perhaps even a problem shark. As it stands, we don't know what proportion of all shark attacks can be attributed to problem individuals, but with more DNA swabs being taken from bite wounds, we might be able to get a better idea of that number. The study that brings forward the idea of the problem shark by Eric Kluwer is actually a really interesting read, although I do think there needs to be a bit more evidence across the other shark species that are often implicated in human attacks. I'd be keen to see some analysis for white sharks or bull sharks to see if the same might apply for those. The real question here though is, if there is truly such a thing as a problem shark, what can we do about it? Now I imagine the first thing that might spring to mind, and it definitely often springs to mind for the authorities in the fallout of these incidents, is a cull. Looking at it specifically, it might make sense to selectively remove an individual from the population so that those traits aren't allowed to genetically spread from generation to generation. Although that's easier said than done, the main issue being that it's so difficult to locate and identify an individual shark with something as large as the ocean. You're talking needle in a haystack here. Even Lagatha, the tiger shark from the Cocos Islands, disappeared for several months before returning again. So you can see that it would be a mammoth task. So authorities often go for what they think is the next best thing, and that's an unselective cull. Although actual scientific evidence for the effectiveness of shark culls isn't particularly convincing. On Reunion Island, as a response to five fatal shark attacks, authorities culled over 500 sharks between 2011 and 2013, only for there to be another six fatal bites in the subsequent four years. And in Australia since the year 2000, there's been more shark-human interactions at beaches where there are shark nets than non-netted beaches. So measures like that likely don't work as effectively as those governments think they do. And so that leaves us with the non-lethal measures, things like temporary swimming bans or beach closures or perhaps drone surveillance. Until we have those numbers though in terms of how many of the hundred or so attacks per year can be attributed to problem sharks, then we don't know which of the mitigation strategies would be best. The Reunion Island authorities tried a bunch of different strategies during that crazy 10 year period, most of which were unsuccessful. And if you wanted to learn about Reunion Island, you can do so in this video right here. At one point in time, Reunion Island was one of, if not the most dangerous place to go in the sea with a fatality rate five times higher than that of the rest of the world. So make sure you check it out here.